A boy was walking his bumblebee, he tied it to a string. The sky was lit up with violet light, a bird began to sing a song of sixpence. I think we're live. Hello. Hello. So this is episode four. Episode four. Of With Paige confidence. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I have notes. <laughs> we have show notes. We're like pro. <laughs> this means we get money now, right? <laughs> I actually sort of know what we're talking about. <laughs> we promise to ramble at a minimum. Mainly because we're tired. Um, so, uh, if this is your first time here, uh, I am Blue Caldwell, this is Kate Citrin, um, we do a once a month podcast where we pick a book and we talk about it. We go back and forth. In theory, we have very different tastes in books. <laughs> we do, but we've been agreeing on everything so far. And I think we agree again this month. <laughs> once we get through the really awesome books that we just love and every human being would love, cat fights will start, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, when we when I, did, did did you see my unboxing for Book Riot? Did you see any of that? Okay. So I actually posted other stuff this month. <laughs> Yay! And I'm so proud of myself. Um, so I got my uh, Book Riot quarterly box. Hmm. Um, so you sign up with Quarterly, which is a company that does a whole bunch of boxes, subscription boxes, and you subscribe. And every couple months, I think it's four times a year. They sent, and that would make sense because it's quarterly. <laughs> um, Did I mention we're tired? <laughs> I'm smart. <laughs> um, uh, so four times a year, you get a box filled with, like, book stuff. Books, uh, book-related things. Um, I would go into it, but I posted a video specifically about it, so go watch it. Um, but uh, in that box was a romance novel. <laughs> Oh, uh, don't. Where did I put it? Where did I put it? I it's gone. The hold cat on. ate it. Hold on. No, no romance. <laughs> the cats are intelligent beings and took the romance novels and threw them out the window. In my defense, because they love me. You're gonna have to read oh, this. Oh God! She's leaning forward. <laughs> <the cleavage. laughs> so this is this is Rebecca Shinsky approved, and uh, so. It looks highly improper. Yep. <laughs> Great. That's not, that's not going to be next month's book. That's down the road. So you don't have to worry about it yet. We might have a second person filling in my spot that month. <laughs> that is the point, I guess. <laughs> okay, so this month, Kate picked... Johannes Cabal, Necro... Oh. First one is Necromancer, and that th I read years ago uh, by happenstance. For this selection, we're doing uh, Johannes Cabal, The Detective. And I did not know when I picked this up that it was a series. Uh, it happened to be in the library, those books we like section, which I love to peruse because I cannot, for the life of me, choose my own books. I've got like a 25% shot at it being decent. Uh, and a 90% shot, I, those don't add up at all, 80% um, <laughs> shot of um, it being horrible, tripe, and I get 20 pages through and then I hate myself for not finishing yet another book. Yeah, I think this is mostly because she's really, really picky. I am, and horribly picky about everything. It's, it's not just books. I mean, they shouldn't feel singled out. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I read this book and could not believe that nobody had recommended it to me. It's awesome. I'd never heard of it before. I, like, shouted from the rooftops. I told my boyfriend about it. I know I told Blue about it. I told a million people about it. Nobody would listen to me. But you know what's funny? Like, when she originally told me about this this month, I said, oh, you know, my creative director told me about this book, and I put, like, five years ago. And I put it on the list. And the other day I went up to him and I said, you know, I just read that book you told me about five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I do. I have a 700 book 
to read this. Um, and he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, well, it was five years ago. So I sent him the book. And he was like, I don't think I told oh you. Oh, my God. God. <laughs> it's like the silence. <laughs> this book is the silence from Doctor Who. But what I, wa I wonder if this is what happened. Because I remember this whole conversation with with Scott, my creative director, being there and him saying, talking about this book and saying he liked the cover art and going on Amazon and saying, yes, this looks really cool and putting it on my wish list. I wonder if you were there, because that was at the time when I think you were sharing my cube freelancing. I might have been the Maybe one. Maybe we had that conversation and Scott just happened to be there and my head mixed it up. Actually, really bad memory. That makes really, perfect really sense. Bad bad memory. Memory. <laughs> when I was wandering around proselytizing right. Johannes Cabal. So maybe Scott was in the conversation and for some reason you my translated brain just my mixed excellent it up. recommendation. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why why I would have thought Scott told me but maybe he commented on it, maybe he looked at the cover and also said it was cool. I don't remember. But obviously <laughs> Um, so I think you actually told me about it originally. For well, minute, it took five years, like, but I got her to read it. Did I just dream this book? And <laughs> <laughs> put it on my list? And it's if magical. To, if you're going to dream a book, this is a damn good book to yes. dream up. Yes, yes. Uh, how I like to describe it and how I've been re -proselytizing. By the way, got on Twitter, said, you know, hashtag praise Johannes Cable. <gasps> Johannes Cable answered me. I was very excited. He even called me Madame. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know I was a Madame. I'm a Madame. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it, the book is fantastic. I describe it as Terry Pratchett mixed with uh, Lovecraft. So it, it's yeah, a very yeah, other yeah. world. It very much references our world enough that you can recognize it and it can make that political commentary, the religious commentary, um, the, the personal commentary, while being just different enough in a very Lovecraftian way that you can see both sides of the argument without getting wrapped up in your own personal affiliations. Right. Um, to me, it reminded me a lot of Good Omens. Um, yeah, I didn't and, and watch I, it. Yeah, and, and, and I was like, you know, the people who love Gaiman and Pratchett would probably like this book. Although I did look through the reviews, and there were some people, it surprised me that they didn't like it so much. They thought it was, um, that it started good, but kind of got meandery. And then I think it did get a little meandery, but I thought it was entertaining the this whole way the through. Both went. Both, Anybody both that books. reads something that's Lovecraftian like this, with a sense of purpose? <laughs> Overall story, like the the premise is that in in uh, the first book, the Necromancer, um, Johannes Cabal has sold his soul um, to gain um, access to the secret of of life and death. Um, but basically, and and he got the secret. But basically, all he can do is make zombies. So he goes back to Satan, and zombies are so passe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he goes back to Satan and says, look, like, I want my soul back. I need my soul because it's interfering. The lack of it is interfering with my work. And Satan laughs at him. Um, but then they make a deal that if, if Johannes Cabal can get a hundred souls for Satan in the course of a year, he can have his soul back. And he gives him this carnival to do it with and it's just it's so fabulous and it's a lot of people complain because you can't it doesn't seem to stick to a time period like it mostly feels kind of Victorian steampunky but there I are more no modern references this, awesome. where I keep I, I keep saying what freaking time period yeah I remember there was that like first Bohemian book. language at one point and I was like okay that's the 60s their like, point they are so purposefully vague about the time mm -hmm. period that it's frustrating and beautiful at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I actually kind of like it, it. It puts me back, like, it, when I was reading about the people sitting outside having hot dogs and beer, uh, well, bratwurst and beer, 
it struck me how people of the 1800s would be people of today. You know, you're, you're, you always think of them as right. past people. But it really, the ambiguity of the time period let you see these people as the frat guys down the street would do the same right. damn thing. They'd just be wearing different clothing. Yeah. Um, so I kind of like the timeless quality of it. It sort of adds to the surreality of it. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, overall, loved it. Um, the the kind of premise of the detective is, uh, or jo Johannes Cabal, the detective, the second book, is that um, it's sort of a murder mystery on an airship. Um, it's, it has a lot more of a... Because airships. Because airships. <laughs> it has a lot more of a steampunky feel than I think the first one does. Mm -hmm. The first one has a little bit of... Um, uh, uh, the Night Circus feel. Did you ever read The Night Circus? I did not, oh, but I'm familiar so with it. Oh, good. I've, I've read um, it out from the library like five times. Yeah, it's really good. That's that's very Neil Gaiman-esque. I could tell from her writing that she was a fan, and then I on Twitter, she's a fan. Um, <laughs> but, um, so that had a little more Night Circus feel, and then this one had a little more, like, steampunk mystery mm -hmm. um feel but, but both of them were good the the f and intentionally it wasn't yes. like they accidentally wandered into these genres it's almost like the author's going what shall we play with next yeah and there's this little short story on on the tail end of it um that has kind of almost like an indiana jones kind of feel so but it all like i mean it's 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 sort of like playing with genre and um you and know, and it. mythology, but it still has, like, a, a, a continuity, I think. It doesn't feel like separate things. Um, the centralized character, uh, Johannes Cabal, is so compelling. Yeah. Uh, he, and, and interesting to try and figure out. That every time you think you've got him pegged, he switches just a little bit, and you're like, oh, okay. And the addition of his soul makes it that much more different, because he did change a little bit and there's right. a very and rational he, he reason for it. becomes a little more human in the second book. Because the first book he is very, he totally, he totally, totally, totally reminded me of um, uh, Benjamin Cumberbatch Sher Sherlock, BBC Sherlock. Um, if, it, it, physical description, like, uh, Johannes Cabal is very blonde, so he does a <clears throat> I know that he says blonde 150 times in the book. I swear the man looks like my boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could totally he see looks that. looks like Jeff. I know he says blonde. I know Jeff would look horrible as blonde. <laughs> but everything else is exactly my boyfriend. Yeah, I, I, when I... Tall, lanky, round six-foot-ish. Yeah. Airs. Mm. 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 Um, <laughs> sorry, Jeff. Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, so I pictured Benjamin Cumberbatch for most of it until he started, like, he's blonde, he's blonde, he's blonde. So now I have in my head this guy who I don't know where where this image came from. I think I went to high school with him. <laughs> okay. He was either an actor or I went to high school with him. Again, no memory. None. <laughs> Sensing a pattern. Up. I inherited it from my father. Um, Makes her a great artist, though. I guess. Um... <laughs> And I, you would think it would make make me better art artist. Like I have total artist like brain, <laughs> but it doesn't. It's translated. translate. It translate. It does. It does. <laughs> um. Anyway, so yes, yeah, so th this like aristocratic, blonde, Germanic, Germanic. So, so that's I actually have in my head now. I don't know who it is. Jeff but that's now in my head. with oh, it, sometimes okay ninety percent of the time it looks like Jeff who has my coloring. Nearly black hair, pale as fuck skin. Um, he has to upload a picture of Jeff. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Show notes. Oh, we should put it. In, put the list of um, the with the comment creators who all did his portrait. Oh. Yeah. We'll yes. put that in there because that's great anyway. <laughs> and there's lots of other cool stuff in there. And so we've got. Uh, he's always Jeff until they specifically say blonde, and then I've got like. Um, True Blood, Eric the Vampire. I've oh, got like yeah, his yeah. head with long, straight blonde hair instead of the slicked back. 
blonde hair stuck onto Jeff's body. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he would be thrilled to know that, knowing that I named our Wi-Fi, or at least I had a battle to try and name our Wi-Fi <laughs> after Eric the Vampire's rear end. <laughs> Vampire butt. And, but anyway, he's completely kind of um, bordering sociopathic, <laughs> especially without a soul. You know, just no social skills. But it's brilliant because there's all a very good reason for it. It's all logically broken out to the fact that he is essentially the savior of humanity because he, unlike everyone else, is trying to solve the problem, the disease of death. Right. And he just doesn't understand why everybody, like, the horrible things he does are completely justified because he's trying to defeat death. Death happens all the time. Why are people so particular about how it happens? <laughs> That's very silly. And he also, he wouldn't value his own life so much if it weren't for the fact that he views himself as integral to, like, he is the key component, the only way that humanity is going to overcome this. So of course he's more important than everybody else. Yeah. He has little, to be. A little bit like a serial killer. But so much more interesting. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful fun. And I understand that that is relatively played out at this point. We've got a lot of anti-heroes. At the time this came out, we did not. Uh, and this was relatively new in the up-and-comings. Right. Um, but even now, it's so well done that the kind of Jack Sparrow qualities of it um, are still incredibly compelling. It's like having lumbering zombies an awful lot, and then you got the fast zombies, and you could really hang on to the fast zombies for a while. Yeah. Um, except the zombies are kind of passive. I know. That's a quote from the book. <laughs> oh, and I've got to mention my favorite thing ever. The, the, so I'm listening to the audiobook. I listen to the audiobook of, of these, although I'm going to go back and read them, just because, um, because they were a little twisty and turny. Like they they were hard to follow sometimes, and I I want to read it again. But so I'm listening to it, and all of a sudden there is a song about Cthulhu. <laughs> yes, and it's actually a song about all the old ones more than more than Cthulhu. But that was the first thing I heard. I'm like, wait, he's singing about Cthulhu. <laughs> this is awesome. So it's sung to the tune of uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic. It's the, the Malef- Maleficarian March Army song, um, and they're, they're marching along and singing the song, and it's just great. She actually has a video that she will post in the show notes <laughs> of her singing, and if you have never heard Blue's voice, it is amazing. Uh, she's a trained opera singer. Not a trained opera singer. She's a trained <laughs> opera singer. Not a trained opera singer. Shut up. <laughs> she's amazing. And her singing about Cthulhu. Pretty fantastic. It was so much fun. <laughs> so yeah, that that was my, my, my one of my favorite things. My very favorite, I'm actually going to see if I can't find here, um, one of my favorite quotes from this entire thing is, uh, Johannes Cable at Cabal is trying to um, figure out it, it what has happened in this murder mystery. And there's... He has gone wildly off the deep end with the scheming and plotting, and he's trying to figure out why uh, it's not just as simple as it seems. And he's off into the deep end plotting, and the quote in here is something about how, and then Occam's razor came back oh, and yeah. waved around threateningly. <laughs> and that was so great that Occam's razor became a razor. <laughs> and... and Brilliant. I've never heard it twisted around that way. Yeah. I just highlighted, dwelled on it, reread it 12 times, texted it to my boyfriend, yeah. and then realized it couldn't because I had to explain too much of the plot to get in to a text. Yeah. Well, and there's and there's so much of that. I mean, there's just tons of quotable stuff, and because um, the language is so, I mean, it's very um, sort of that, that very kind of older, descriptive um very British humor kind of style. The humor about the Brits? Awesome! Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's so good, and it's so much fun. And there, there is a third book, uh, 
the, uh, which is the Brothers Cabal, I believe. Sorry, mm-hmm. I didn't write that down. There are like five total. Yeah, well, and there's another one coming out at the end of this year in October. So. Yeah. Fun! Mm-hmm. So I get October's choice, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I guess what we're reading. Well, and I think that would be a fun October read, too. Oh! Timely. Mm-hmm. Look at us being professional and timely. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> All right. So, um, one thing that we haven't done that maybe we should do, I don't know, is do we, do we give our star ratings for stuff? Sure, although I will say that when I do star ratings for books, they're all like three stars. Yeah. All I, the time. I, 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 do, I do a lot of four. Really? Yeah. If, I if, feel like... If I mostly like something, it's four. Yeah. If I'm just kind of, eh, it's three. If I really dislike it, it's two. I, I don't think I ever give anything one star. It would have to really offend me. <laughs> I read, no. It would have to be something really awful in it. I read really low because I, I read a lot... S- Star four and sometimes five are books that shook me, which are, it's a phrase that was used when I was in college. Somebody was trying to tell professors, you know, give us a list of things that we should really read. And it wasn't important. It wasn't just like books that influenced you or were important to you. The phrase, I loved it. Books that shook you, like to your foundations, change the way you think. Right. And I read a lot of books that change the way I think. Yeah. So, lest my Goodreads shelf look like I only rate all five stars, <laughs> it would be, like, I have to skew everything down. Yeah. Because if I don't like it, I just stop reading and it never gets rated. Right. And mine is more, like, if it if it's one of my favorite books ever, and this was one of my favorite books ever. Um, I found a winner! <laughs> <laughs> um... I, I rate them five. I rated this five. Um, See, as much as I love this, I still would have put this yeah, in like three Yeah, it's not like life-changing. I mean, I, I loved it. Um, but I don't have like that many favorite books. Like if I had something that shook me, it would just go into the favorite book category. Okay. Um, so most things I give fours to. Like, a, you know, and that spans a range of stuff. Like, you know... Sookie Stackhouse books. Those are fours. And those are not... I love those books. I love those books. But they're not great books, per se. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I love them. So yeah, if fours. I'm not, like, depressed in my room for a week, it doesn't get a yeah. four. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff knows when I've read a four or five. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, please let Blue choose a book. <laughs> actually said that to me last oh, night. No. <laughs> this was fine, but I, I read some other things, and uh, I'm emotionally a little bit rot right now because I'm so sleep deprived from a lot of really great stuff. Good stuff's happening, but you know, you, you get worn down. Yeah, she said too much good stuff happening. A lot of good stuff, but you can't say no to any of it. No fighting. Come here, kiddos. Right, the kitties are fighting. I know, they're cute. Sorry. Um... <laughs> Yeah, so, like, I'm emotionally worn, and I start reading books on tape at work because I've got a 320-page brand book that I'm editing. And when you start going through those kind of edits, book on tape time. Yeah. So I get my book on tape, and I'm like, this is really great. This is... Oh, my God. And, of course, everybody else thinks I'm listening to iTunes. (laughs) Here's Kate going, like, Eli Golding. So they have no idea what's wrong with the new girl. <laughs> this new contractor came in. She is a mess. <laughs> no, you don't. It's weird. Shakespearean. Wait. Never mind. I'm gonna put the right here. Okay. I think. I think this sentence is missing a word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't. I can't listen to stuff like that at work. I don't want. Unfortunately, I have not actually broken out, but like in places where I wanted to like revel in it, I'm like, pause. Yeah. I'm going to eat an apple now. <laughs> la 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 la. Yeah, this is why most of my audiobooks tend towards fluffy, just because, like I said, when we read Fought in the Shards, like in the car, driving, like <laughs> sobbing. <laughs> Turn it off! Turn it off! We're gonna stop it! We're gonna stop it! Like, <laughs> yeah. Been there. Done that. <laughs> Read it on the train. We're gonna go to the wine and cheese tasting now! 
Yeah. <laughs> so how was your snowboarding trip? Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Sorry, wandering again. <laughs> <laughs> Very good at that. Uh, but yeah, I was looking at my notes here. I just would like to read this note over here. Um, <clears throat> what fucking time period? <laughs> Exclamation point, question mark. <laughs> yes, I had a beta note at, at, at some point that would have been one of my notes. <laughs> well, I, I kept going back and forth, too, and, and that one was at the people were feeling well disposed towards the ruling class. They showed this by milling around eating sausages, swilling beer, and slapping one another on the back and laughing too loudly. Last week in Wrigley Field? Or <laughs> 1800s? Don't know. Yeah, well, and especially in Britain. I read an article today that uh, there was something in England and they mentioned a Ministry of Agriculture. And I was like, there's really ministry? It's like Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> or 1984. <laughs> 1984 did not make that stuff up. <laughs> I mean, it made stuff up. <laughs> I had, well, I was, the same issue I had with Terry Pratchett, except for, where's the Terry Pratchett will tell you, uh, not, not time period, because it's parallel world, but very different. Um, Terry Pratchett very pointedly would tell you what place he was actually talking about. Like, You'd read, you'd hear both sides of the story, and then you'd be like, oh, that is clearly Iraq, that is clearly Iran, right. and that is Afghanistan. In this one, for a while, I thought it was the Bosnian War. See, good, because I was like, was okay, I feel like I should know what this is a metaphor And then I thought it was for... World War One, and I was like, this is the, the entryway into World War II. Right. And that's where I settled on, because of the Germanic references, but it very easily could have also been the bosnian Herzegovinian uh, conflict. I would never mess with that. <laughs> <laughs> Serbian, uh, Serbian <laughs> massacre of Bosnian people. Vaguely. Yeah. <laughs> 1980s. Uh, okay, oh. yes. Yeah, 90s. Okay. 90s. But I still 90s, don't know right? any other details. 84? Oh, God. Sorry for being ignorant. It'll... Show notes. <laughs> um, yeah, my notes right here. Balkan war Wars? Serbia? Oh, here's another what fucking time period. This one does not have an exclamation point. That's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, what country are they supposed to be? And I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily have to. I mean, it's obviously an alternate world. There's airships. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I feel like that that's at least justification for, like, it's not our time uh, timeline. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, but I, because he mixes in stuff that's obviously, well, there's even, you know, England, our world. England exists even in the fact that it was colonizing much of the world and then withdrew. Uh, in this world. So right. it's, it's... Yeah, that's right. Close enough. Like, in a lot of ways, it is our world. But in a lot of ways, it's, it's not. not. And I really... And especially the detectives was farther removed mm -hmm. than the uh, necromancer was. Yes. Yes. I actually... I really appreciated the fact that I couldn't put my finger on it because in Terry Pratchett, when I can so easily, uh, it becomes less about the general realities of humanity and more about the specific realities of the conflict. Okay. In this one where I couldn't put my finger on it and I was like, oh, that happened in this war. That happened in this war. Yeah, and I think it's supposed to be general. It is taking bits and pieces from everywhere. It gives you more of a, a, an ability to grasp onto the human nature aspect of it rather than the political what was happening right, right. then. Which wasn't as pertinent as just the general backstabbiness. Yeah. In this one. Which is, you know, very appropriate for a, a murder drama in Lovecraftian mm -hmm. dinner mystery sense. Um, and again, the verbiage on this one is fantastic. Um, you get little tiny 
bits of sentence that are, are so beautifully crafted, like, um, every few minutes to be silently appalled that Ka Cabal was still... Silently appalled. That's beautiful! You know that, that... <laughs> and it's so British. I love that. Yeah. So there are a lot of those little... Um, oh, and, and another proof that we were in this world. They actually mention Ursa Major and other constellations that are in our world. So there, it, it does bounce back and forth pretty f freely. <coughs> I also loved his um, anti-socialness. There's one of the quotes that I loved, and I think I tweeted, tweeted this. Um, he was talking to this couple, and he, it said, uh, They serve to remind Cabal, should a reminder ever be necessary, why his social skills were so poor. People were loathsome, loathsome and not worth the practice. <laughs> <laughs> I related to that as well. Mm -hmm. It was fun. I also like the description of Cabal. I mean, it, if you'll notice, a lot of this is descriptions of him because he's fascinating uh, and very easily to relate to in, you know, the not great qualities of yourself that are kind of awesome. Right. Um, they're describing uh, that 13-year-old prepubescent coming-of-age time period. Um, Cabal was never a floppy-haired youth. That is to say, he was perhaps perhaps five or so years younger than Cabal. Uh, he's describing somebody else. Cabal ha had, however, worked very hard to cram such grotesque quantities of responsibility, activity, and learning, both theoretical and practical, into every one of his days, that his years became akin to dog years. I was like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's why I don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> More stuff! Must learn more things. <laughs> there are things in this world. Yeah. And I think they were talking about we did we actually didn't mention his brother. He he has a brother named Horst Horst, um, who is uh, very charming and social and also a vampire. I think and it's Cabal's fault that he's a vampire. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um and he is a very, very fun character as well. He he helps. Cabal goes and gets him out of the hole that he left him in for many, many years <laughs> um, to help him run this carnival because he doesn't know what people like. <laughs> the whole thing is wonderful because all sorts of things will crop up from other adventures that Cabal has had, and they all kind of tie in and they explain just enough that it's okay and, and you're intrigued and you're like, oh, okay, that was neat. But you get the sense that his life is clearly one adventure to the next adventure to the next adventure ad nauseum, and they are believably not his fault, just the nature of the fact that he happens to be a necromancer and therefore the shit gets thrown in his lap. Yeah. And he's like, we will deal with this next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's great. Everybody should go read the book. Praise Johannes! <laughs> Everybody read Johannes! Thank you. If, if this podcast does anything for you, anything at all, I would ask, please, <laughs> just read this book. Five years I've been trying to get the world of Yo word of Johannes out to the masses. I've gotten one I in guess five there's years. A, there's a couple of people on, on Goodreads that are, are added it to their list. One person... I've added it to the list does not count. One person is reading it. Um, another person ordered it. Another person added it to their list. So we're spreading the word. I told That's two more wrong. people today. That equals 7,245 that should be converted to the Church of Johannes <laughs> and have not been. I'm not very good at proselytizing. <laughs> I am so glad I'm not part of, like, a church group. <laughs> I feel like I'm good at, at, good at promoting books. Um, That's good, because I suck at it. <laughs> People are like, you like that? I, I think I'll read something else. Thanks. <laughs> I don't think I've ever gotten a couple of people to do anything else. <laughs> I, I just, I think the things that I say that I think are interesting are not good promotions. Yeah. It's about this necromancer and he's a horrible person. 
<laughs> well, most, I, I guess most of the, the people that I that I thought would like it are like game game and impression fans. And like I said, I think if you if you already like that, I mean, there are people who are not going to like this book, obviously. Um, but there are people who don't like game and impression. I've, I've met them. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I think you kind of already have to be there, but if you're there, it's likely. And to be fair, when I discovered it, it was sitting on a shelf with nobody to promote it, so I had unrealistically low expectations. I thought probably I would read 10 pages and right. be done with it. So the fact that it turned out to be such a charming little book, it was like finding that little French film that nobody has talked about it just right. happens to be on netflix or something unassuming yeah and it changes your world i mean not yeah. that big but I'm you just, know i'm amazed that it doesn't have some sort of underground following You're like i'm i'm i, I don't I, I know why it's not like on I'm, twitter yeah <laughs> um well i think that's the author because the author's on twitter really Dude. I mean, I could be wrong. I don't know who it is, but I just assumed, because he is also on Twitter, so I assumed that that's just him. <laughs> I threatened to stalk him on Twitter as a joke. <laughs> I might actually. <laughs> he warned you. <laughs> he did warn me that he w people have died that way, but what a way to go. Soon. <laughs> Yeah, the magic of Twitter. <laughs> or actually, the magic of social media in, in general. I, I have a, a, a fun uh, Goodreads happening, too. So, I'll talk about that later. So, all right. This was a yes. Go read it. Um, other things? I, I don't know if there's any point in, mis in mentioning this, because I don't know when this will actually be live. And, but... I'll mention it anyway. The Printer's Row Fest is happening this weekend here in Chicago. So if you live here, um, there's lots of neat stuff going on. And <laughs> I'm not going to really be able to go to most of it because I'm going to be in class. Um, and we're uh, we're doing the color run on Sunday morning. And I'm going to try and go afterwards. But I don't know how that's really going to work out. Um, biking downtown and then running a 5K and then doing brunch, and then, and brunch, then going to the printer's row, and then row possibly going to printer's row. I doubt this is really going to happen, but I'm going to work a full day. After <laughs> <too>. <laughs> also, I always feel bad when printer's row comes around because, like, I, I the majority of people who are there, are, I, they have it's a great literary fest, and they have great literary people, most of whom I have no idea who they are. <laughs> that is the problem with books. <laughs> Seriously, there are so many of them that like. You have your little niche, your, like, handful of authors that you know, and even the biggies, there are so right. many. They come up with hundreds of, of the biggies right. alone every year. I mean, bravo us for having so many people willing to do this, but it is a daunting task to try and know authors. Right. And, and there are some um, sort of more known names, like James Patterson is going to be there. I think he's promoting his children's books. I didn't write that one down because I don't know a whole lot about James Patterson, but um, I saw that him. he was going to be there. Yeah, and I think my, my mom likes him um, and my stepdad. Um, the two that that I would be going to if I could go to them, um, Gail Gand is going to be there. She, is, um, she was the executive pastry chef of True, which was, mm. was, was, is one of the best restaurants here in Chicago. I think it's kind of been surpassed a little bit by like Next and, a and um, Aviary? And not Aviary, uh, Alinea oh. um, at this point. But it was, it is one of the top restaurants. If it's still around, is the tree still there? I think so. I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she was the executive pastry chef, high-end pastry chef. Um, I think she's now a little bit more of a food writer. Um, she, she does a lot of food journalism. But uh, she just came out with a cookbook, which I got, uh, <laughs> on making lunches. And I actually just made uh, some bean soup from it and uh, a sandwich. The sandwich was entirely a little bit too much sandwich. 
Um, but that sounds good. <laughs> Do a sandwich a little bit. Yes, a little bit <laughs> going on. Um, but uh, she's going to be down there. There's a good eating stage where they have a lot of food authors. Um, and chefs that come uh, and do cooking demonstrations. She's going to be doing demonstrations. And then uh, Laurel K. Hamilton, who does paranormal uh, paranormal romance, um, I understand, eventually evolving into sort of soft porn stuff. Um, she does the Anita Blake series, which I read the first few of and were good, but everybody told me it kind of devolves into, like, really hardcore, um, which I'm not a big fan of. <laughs> so, you know I'll be reading that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I know a lot of people who are big fans, so she's going to be down there um, promoting her new book, uh, Shiver of Light, which is uh, the fairy series. I can't remember what it's called now. Um, I made notes, but obviously not enough notes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but lots of other good stuff going on down there. I just didn't know what a lot of it was. A lot of, a lot of talks on the future of, of publishing and, and digital, which I would totally be going to if I weren't in class. And there's one talk that I really wish I could go to, but I gotta go draw. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Too much stuff going on. It's the benefits and problems of living in a fantastic city. Yeah. Although I did I did see today that Book TV is going to be um, streaming some of it. I, I should have wrote down uh, what they were streaming. But um, So if you don't live in this area or if you can't make it as well, uh, go check out. And they're going to be uh, streaming some of the talks. Fantastic. So aside from... Johannes Cable, a cabal, both of them. Uh, what else did you read? Uh, this was a good reading month. <laughs> Her list is so daunting. I'm like, I, I really felt like I did good this month considering how much I was working. I'm like, I got some books in. Then I, oh. Because I, I all of these are audiobooks. Uh, yeah. There's, there's one, which is, I'm still reading, it, that is not an audiobook on here. Um, or actually two. Um, so for, for vaginal fantasy this month, we, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> she we, said vagina. <laughs> <laughs> we read, um, it was, uh, fairy tales, the theme they do, they do kind of a theme every month. And these were actually two really good books, like mythology, thick, um, brutal. Both of them were based on like old, um, one was a Germanic fairy tale, uh, and the other one, they might have both been German, but one translated it into more kind of an Irish tale. Um, but uh, Daughter of the Forest uh, by Juliette Marillier and Deerskin by Robin McKinley, both really good. Um, violent, um, a little rapey, if it's a trigger, don't read them, but, um, but really, really good. Uh, and not overly romancy. I mean, more just good story, good writing. Um, I read Midnight Crossroads by Charlene Harris. That came out this month. Uh, she is the one who wrote the Suki Sackhouse series. Um, this is her new series. Uh, good. I don't think you would like it um, very much. It it was... I, I liked it. I don't know if I liked it as much. I don't really remember the first Suki book. It felt like a first book in a series. Um, there's a lot of setting up. It's about a little, uh, supernatural town in Texas. Um, but it's good. I, I think it's a good circuit replacement. If you like that, you probably like this. Um, uh, I'm reading Eleanor Park, which is, or listening to, almost done with, uh, a young adult book that came out last year that, um, got a lot of, of good press, um, by Rainbow Roll, Roll. Um, who is a, a pretty well-known young adult writer. Uh, really good. Um, t teenage romance but in a very, like, real-life sort of way, not like sparkly vampire kind of way. Sorry <laughs> if you like sparkly vampires. Um, but, you know, that sort of angsty romance stuff, it has this, but in it seems very real, and the, the story is very real. And um, 
it's the interesting thing is that, is that it's it's almost written for my generation because they are teenagers at the same time I was a teenager so all the pop culture references and there's some some very mainstream but also a little bit more on the obscure side like Ready Player One yeah okay um uh, so it's, it's almost, and they, and they, they, uh, they're having a high school talk about literature at one point and they're talking about Romeo and Juliet and they say, um, you know, the teacher asks like, you know, why you think Romeo and Juliet is stupid? Well, why is it, you know, remains so powerful for so long? And the, uh, one of the main characters says, he's like, well, because adults want to remember what it's like to be young and in love. And that's kind of this book. I mean, because it's very much first love, that very seriousness of it. So although, important. Although they have other things in there going, going on in their life, too, that are serious. But um, uh, it reminds me a little bit of Fault in Our Stars, but so far I'm not quite sure where it's going at the point I'm at. It could be sad. <laughs> but not, not Fault in Our Stars sad. Um, not crying in your car to the audiobook, Sad. Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's good. Good to know. Safe to read in the car. <laughs> Should develop readings on that. Safe to read in car. Safe to read at work. <laughs> Safe to read only at home in your bed with the door closed. Yes. <laughs> um, I read Fallen Beauty by uh, Erica Roebuck, uh, which was, that was one of the ones um, I read on Kindle. Uh, or no, it was library book. Uh, about, it was a historical fiction partially about Edna St. Vincent Millay, um, who I didn't know anything about. The poet um, was crazy. <laughs> Fascinating, but crazy. You did say poet. That might be redundant. Yeah. Um, and it sort of set her up with, like, she's living outside of this um, small town, and there's, so it focuses on the character in the small town, fictional, um, and then the relationship with the poet and... It was interesting. It was it was well done. Um, and then I got a clout perk. Um, I am Pilgrim. Um, and the whole like clout perk thing has been a really good experience in that um, I saw my friend got the perk and I was sad because I like to get all the book perks. Um, and then I got it too, so I was happy. And then I was all excited, and she got hers. I'm waiting for mine. I'm waiting for mine. It's not showing up. And I mentioned on Twitter that it's not showing up. And um, one of the guys from the publisher contacts me on Twitter and says, you know, if it doesn't show up, email me. So I actually ended up emailing back and forth with him, and he ended up approving me on NetGalley. He, he was like, I'll overnight it to you, or I'll approve you on NetGalley, whichever you want. Um, and so I got the book, and they were very nice. And um, that was uh, Dave Brown from Simon & Schuster. He's Dr. Blogstein on Twitter. Um, and the book is, I mean, this is like hardcore thriller, mm. you know, um, kind of blockbustery, y um, very uh, page-turning. Um, the only complaint I have about it is that it's a, it's a terrorist situation. And I haven't read a lot of these kind of books, it seems a little like rah rah America and a little anti Muslim to me. <laughs> but um, I don't know how it compares to other books like this. I haven't really heard, I've, I've looked at some reviews and things and haven't seen other people saying that, so that might just be my impression. Um, it just, we might be a little oversensitive too. Yeah, it just seems like they, they, a lot of the Muslims, I know a lot of bad stuff happens in Muslim culture cultures with the extremist religion but it just seems like there's very much a focus on that and it's sort of painting well anytime you focus on extremists in a religion you unfortunately don't get to mention that there are extremists in every religion right. well, and, <laughs> and so it doesn't give you a good yeah and then there are also non extremists in those countries yeah so it, well, it's not focused on something right so it's not like i feel like what they're saying is not true i know the things that they're saying happen happen um but um i just it feels like they're saying that's kind of all that happens but it's not meant to be 
that story it's meant to be a thriller <laughs> so i might be expecting a little bit too much <laughs> they from, needed Nazis. from the thriller Chana, <laughs> Groner, yeah and the thriller aspect of it is fairly terrifying because it's about uh, biological warfare and it i, I was saying that'll this, do it yeah i was saying this on universal geek um i don't know how well researched this is <laughs> but if it is wow um Yes, yeah. it's pretty scary. We've gotten to a point that is amazingly frightening. Yeah. Um, there, there are so many issues with how much you can share with what you can reproduce and how do we tell our scientists not to share. Right. But at the same time, if they do, everybody sees it. But even if they don't, everybody can do this now. Yeah. And so. Yeah. So we've got kind of like super spies and... Uh, rogue terrorists creating super viruses, and it's 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 good. Yay! I like it. Is that all? Yeah, that's all you read <laughs> this month. <laughs> Lots of audio. Lots of audio. <laughs> I will only be talking for about three seconds. <laughs> Um, I read uh, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children by Ransom Riggs. I also read that. I it, really liked it. Yeah, it, it's Ransom Riggs' um, debut novel. Mm -hmm. It is another one of those sneaky YA novels that I did not realize. This it, I saw the book. It was from World Book Night. I got it. it, it I'm like, oh, great. Wait, it, and then I'm like, God, ah, YA, which I have nothing against YA. As a genre, it's wonderful. I'm very glad it exists. I believe that our, our teenagers need good literature. Please continue writing good literature for them. Um, the thing is that I no longer care about the things that <laughs> teenagers care about. And I am a selfish human being. <laughs> when I choose books, I want to care about what I'm reading about. <laughs> I don't care what adults care about. <laughs> <laughs> very bad at putting myself in other people's shoes. <laughs> so, uh, things like first love and ab abandonment issues with parents and, you know, that, that struggle between developing your own personality and, uh, and being under your parents' tutelage. I'm not there. I haven't been there for a very long time. When I was there, it was everything. I crossed that bridge. I'm done. <laughs> we all survived. <laughs> the Miss Perkins is about the creepy house and the little monster the kids. <laughs> <laughs> it is also <laughs> about parental relationships. <laughs> and house first is love. little monster kids. <laughs> okay, love the creepy house. Love the little monster kids. Love the inner waving. I even love how this story came about, which uh, when... Uh, uh, Ransom Riggs was, uh, came to his publisher with a bunch of old photographs, which actually my uncle has published a book of really freaky old photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm fascinated by these things. I didn't even get to see the darn things because I got this audiobook. Um, oh, you did, did that by audiobook? I did end up looking them up online okay, afterwards. Okay. Uh, but like as I'm reading this, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see these books. But yeah. I'm like, but I'm on page 320, so I have to keep doing this. Uh, but uh, he, he got these book pictures, brought them to the publisher, and the publisher said, this is great. Why don't you string together a little narrative about these? Ransom Riggs goes back and strings a massive novel that creates a whole nother world and a, a, a Dark and pieces of this I really do care about and believe does transcend uh, generations. Uh, the love of your grandparents, the love of your parents, that sort of thing. It's, it's the trial boundaries testing that I'm over. Um, but a lot of this is an amazing story. Uh, beautifully woven, very compelling. Uh, even though I didn't care about the main subtext of the book, I got to the end, and I was still kind of living in the book a little bit, and yeah. I really wanted to get... There is a second one. Warning. Yeah, it just came out. This is just a trick. I, I, haven't, <laughs> I haven't read that one yet. I got to the end of the book, and I'm like, ah, what? <clears throat> now I have to buy a second book. I don't want to 
buy a second <laughs> book. It's a YA novel. I don't want to read this book, but I want to know what happened. So it actually made me question if I knew what a good book was. Because although I was like, eh, it's an okay book, but it's not a really good book, I still got to that point where I'm like, but I really want to know what happens. Which yeah, is the mark of a good book. Yeah, no, I've read some bad books, and I was like, I'm vaguely kind of interested in what no, I really to wanted to read the rest okay, of it. Okay, well, I'm going to read it, because I really liked it. Oh, good. I, I'll read it eventually. And I don't mind why. <laughs> I, I even have a little button that I got in my book right. right oh, did but, you? Let me see. My box. I read why. <laughs> Yay! I'm conceited. I only live in my world. I do not read YA, except for when they fucking I trick me. I live in my world. I still feel 16. <laughs> <laughs> either. <laughs> but I am not battling with my dad over who's going to make me eat my peas anymore. Yeah, I guess I, I, did, I was off doing my own things when I was a teenager. I mean, I battled with my parents, but I was I had a lot of independence, so. Oh. Um. <laughs> so you might still be playing that one out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that one was wonderful. Um, I am... The Weird Sisters, which we actually saw the author speak at our local bookshop mm -hmm. uh, like a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, it sounded fantastic. Always wanted to read it. Thought, you know, this is definitely a book that I will be interested in. And that's the one that I was reading Book on Take at work where I'm like, because it is such a great, um, it, it really gets to the nitty-gritty of what it's like to be a family and to have sisters. Now, right. I, I have one sister and one brother, but my di family dynamic is the same one, two, three that the book's three sisters are. Uh, and granted, uh, the sisters are so clearly characterized as who they are that you will find a bit of yourself in every yeah. person. Uh, it, it's very intentionally that way, where it's even written in uh, third-person omnipresent so that... You are in everybody's head. It's a we. It's a collective. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I, I think, uh, very good for even single children can relate to oh, it yeah, as well. Oh, yeah. I loved it. That was, it was my uh, World Book Night choice, and I got it. Um, and uh, I think we talked about it before. It's the one where the, the father is a Shakespeare professor. So, you know, the family communicates and Shakespeare quotes. And, um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a great. beautiful family dynamic of how each of the sisters feed each other, how they help each other. And if you're looking at it as, as your own self, it's how you support yourself and how your different qualities uh, play out as well. But it, a lot of the times they'd have little, little bits that were just so true to life that I'd be reading along innocently and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, that's my sister! <laughs> I have to call her now! And I'm not that person. It was just, it was so spot on. Uh, so I, I appreciated that. Basil! Kiss kiss! <laughs> uh, and I also read, although reading is kind of a glorified word for this, uh, Astray in the Woods this by I know nothing about. Allison Wilgus. And uh, she's actually, I went to TCAF, TCAF uh, last weekend, which is Toronto Comic Arts Festival, which is uh, kind of like um, a con, except for it's a giant artist's alley. And it's all independent art artists and authors. So you get everybody who's done self-publishing, and some of these are amazing. We're talking award-winning books here. Uh, and this author that I spoke with is just lovely. It, this one's held up in Toronto, if I didn't mention that. Uh, she's actually American, but um, she did online every, I think, day for a year. Yeah, 365 pages would make sense. Every day for a year, she would post um, a picture that she drew of a cat or you know the, and the, you are the cat and it would play out like a pick your path adventure where everybody could submit what they want the cat to do and she would choose one of the answers the only rule was that the cat has to actually as a cat physically be able to do this um, so she'd choose an answer and the cat would go do that and it takes you on this fantastic little journey and it is a little oh, fantastical 
and um, there's there's a big beast that you've got to figure out, and and you like playing a little video game, you start learning how to use the tools around you. So it would be this beautiful color spread of, of what the, the cat's doing and where in the, the environment the cat is. And then on the up opposing page, it would be what she just did, what she learned from the experience, and then in the lower quarter, what she chose to happen next. And then you'd flip the page and there'd be a beautiful illustration of what she did next, sometimes oh, several cool. pages of it, and then what she, what she did, how she learned from it, and what she chose to do next. And it was a very cute little story. I liked it. And she, uh, Allison, yes, Wilgus, uh, W-I-L-G-U-S, uh, is a phenomenal artist. Just phenomenal. And a sweet human being, too. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, it was that a sounds lot great. Fun. It was a... I would like to read that. If anybody is anywhere near TCF at Toronto when it comes around its annual, go to it. It's free. They host it in the library so that it can remain free. Uh, and considering people come in from, you know, all over the country and outside of the country, uh, it's amazing that they can put this on. And they've got authors um, speaking throughout different venues and different bars and stuff nearby because the library is not quite big enough to hold all this awesome. So cool. Very cool. And I did appreciate it. And that's all I read. Um, okay, so... Other stuff. Are, other stuff. We are running long, so I'll try and, and be short. Um, I wanted to mention Penny Dreadful. Have you watched Penny Dreadful? No, probably not. Okay. Um, Penny Dreadful is on Showtime? Showtime. Um, new show uh, based on, um, they take the mythologies of Dracula and Frankenstein and Dorian Gray and, is there one other one? Uh, Jack the Ripper's in there, um, and they mish it all together, and I've only cut, watched a couple of episodes so far, and um, I liked it. I wasn't entirely sure it, it was going to be successful. It seems to be getting a lot of really good reviews, though. I mean, there are a few episodes in right now, and I've only watched a couple, um, but it's really interesting, and it's, it's really pretty. Um, I love the way it's the way it's filmed. I mean, it, they they are basically um, it's very cinematic. Um, but um, if you like horror uh, and well, kind of like Victorian horror, especially, um, you should check it out. Um, it's, it's it's still on Showtime right now, so uh, it'll probably take a little while for it to get to um, online viewing. I'm not sure if they let non Showtime people watch on the site or not. But um, uh, check it out or, or torrent it. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's good. Um, I also wanted to mention The Fault in Our Stars uh, premieres this weekend. Um, I've been seeing people who have gone to see screenings and it seems to be getting into some good reviews. Um, it definitely looks good. Um, so um, I want to check that out eventually. If you're interested, it comes out this weekend. Um, I also wanted to, I discovered a po another podcast this weekend that is kind of like the male equiv equivalent of us. Um, <laughs> there's a whole lot less giggling. Um, giggling is underrated. As is frolicking. <laughs> <laughs> but it's called Booked. Um, I've only listened to one episode, one episode and a half. And that, the episode I was listening to today was actually a, a from a live event, so it wasn't them. They were uh, streaming from an event that they host or participate in. They're local. They're up somewhere near Milwaukee. I don't know exactly where they're based, but they have a um, noir bar event up in Milwaukee that I'd actually like to go to sometime. It's like crime writers, crime Ooh. and mystery writers. Um, huh. And the the uh, they were streaming an author on the, the latest podcast I was listening to. Um, but anyway, it's good. I, they do a very similar thing to us. Generally, they pick a book. The The one that I listened to that was actually a book review was, um, I can't remember the name of the book, but it was Rick Springfield's book. <laughs> <laughs> that um, sounded crazy. Uh, <laughs> but um, if, if, uh, if you like this, you'll 
probably like that. Maybe you'll like that better. I don't know. It's less giggling. Um, uh, let's see. Other things I want to talk about. I talked about the Book Riot unboxing. Um, I also wrote a review of Cinnamon and Gunpowder by Eli Brown, which I believe I've talked about before on here. But the um, uh, paperback version came out this week. Um, I also, I keep saying every time I talk about this book that I don't know how historically accurate it is. So I saw that the re author is on Goodreads, so I decided to just write him and ask him. So I can keep saying, you know, I could say, uh, stop saying I don't know. Um, so he said, I asked him about the food preparations and also about um, one of the main characters is a female pirate captain. So I asked him about both of those things, and he said, as for the food preparations, I tried to aim for a historical accuracy while still appealing to modern culinary sensibilities. It was a tricky balancing act, and I'm sure some artistic license was taken. It feels very accurate, but I was curious because some of the preparations seemed very modern, so this totally makes sense. Um, as for woman pir women pirates, there are lots of true adventuresses to be inspired by, and Bonnie, Mary Reed, and Ching Shi, S-H-I-H, to name a few. Uh, and he sent um, the Wikipedia for Ching, the Wikipedia entry, so I'll link to that. Um, but I thought that was kind of cool. Yay, social media. <laughs> um, I think we've covered everything you mentioned, TCAF. TCAF. <laughs> I did want to say that there was one cool trick that I just learned accidentally about how to um, not necessarily cheat your library, but cheat your library. <laughs> um, yeah, this cable, I, a cabal I got on ebook and uh, discovered on the L. Uh, it's it's my morning reading on the way downtown every morning, and I was heartbroken that my my subscription I realized in the morning I was like oh crap I forgot to renew it it expired yesterday I'm not gonna have anything to read on the train today and I don't know that I'll be able to rewrench it out because it's a pretty popular book yeah so I was a little freaked out and I opened my iPad and like oh, okay it's there <gasps> this is great I was in the tunnel so by the time I turned on my thing, I had no oh, Wi-Fi. So if you turn off the Wi-Fi... Turn off your Wi-Fi. They can't take your book back. <laughs> I still have it. That was two weeks ago. <laughs> I will turn on my Wi-Fi again this evening, thus returning Johannes Cabal and receiving the Neil Gaiman that I have have put on hold. Oh, which Neil Gaiman? Uh, you know, I, I, it's either Good Omens mm -hmm. or um, American Gods. Okay. And I don't, I don't remember which. American Gods? That's Gaiman, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. There's, it's, there's also a, a like a, a big, I think, theatrical audiobook production of that. Ooh. Oh, they that's a, cool. There's like a special version. I'm gonna go back to all reading though. I, yeah. I only do audiobooks when, when I you have like production. When I've got production, and, and it's got to be like eight hours of production. By then, I'm just like, I need something. Um, but yeah, so neat trick that I didn't tell you, um, that doesn't necessarily work for many weeks at a time if you are that irresponsible. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Uh, okay, I think that is everything. Um, if you want to find us online, you can go to pagespodcast.com. We're pretty much on all the social media sites. Um, mostly, I am active on Twitter. Uh, we have a Goodreads group. There aren't a whole lot of people in it. I try and post in there. Um, if we ever get more people in it, hopefully there'll be a little more interaction um, if you're watching this. and uh, Oh, I forgot to say the next book. That's important. Yes! Oh my goodness. Okay. What are we going to do now? <laughs> so... Uh, if you are interested in reading along with this book, join the Goodreads group and we can talk about it. Um, so uh, I went. It looks big. I went running with one of the guys, uh, uh, or a, a few of the people from um, my figure drawing group and Kate's figure drawing group as well. And we went for one of them's a vampire. Yeah, the guy who runs our figure drawing group is a vampire. You're a vampire, Josh. Um, I told him this weekend. Did he? Okay, so, he, so, so yes. he knows we know. Yes. It's okay. Right. Um, I was excited. It's the first time I've ever met. 
<laughs> yeah, as far as I know, this is my first vampire too. Um, so we, uh, it was, it was uh, a few of us. We went to um, one of their houses or apartments and had breakfast. Like they made us breakfast. I mentioned the podcast. She brought out this book that she was reading um, to to tell me about it. And when I left, I realized I still had the book in my hand, and I stole her book. <laughs> I steal books from the library. She steals books from some friends. And we are bad, bad women. <laughs> so I was very embarrassed because I really don't know this person very well. And it was like, I stole her book. What if she was reading the book? If somebody took my book when I was in the middle of reading it, I would be really upset. <laughs> so um, I don't have any way to contact her, so I contact. Uh, the guy who runs the figure drawing group, and it was like, I stole her book. Like, can I come and bring it to you so you can give it back to her? Uh, so I came and brought it to her. She was there as well, and she was like, um, you can just hold on to the book and read it. <laughs> okay. So it looks like a very good book, so I decided um, that this would be our pick this month uh, so that I actually get time to read it and stuff so I can give it back to her. Lovely um, story. What's it about? Uh, it is The Dove Keepers <laughs> by Alice Hoffman. I don't really know that much about it. Uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, 900 Jews held out for months against armies of Romans on Masada. This sounded like it was Oh, I know alley. all about Masada. Okay. Yeah. Um, according to the ancient history, historian Josephus, two women and five children survived. Based on this tragic and iconic event, Hoffman's novel is a spellbinding tale of four extraordinary, bold, resourceful, and sensuous women, each of whom has come to Masada by a different path. So oh like, sounds my. like something you would like. An awful lot. I'm going to be in the room for like a week weeping. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jeff. Okay. Ah. So this makes up for this later. Just remember that. <laughs> um, it sounds wonderful. That That is uh, the, the uh, story of Masada has been so blown out and romanticized and used as a, a torch for, you know, these Israeli people for so long that it's very hard to sort out fact from fiction. Yeah, I know nothing about this. Yeah. Surprise! <laughs> uh, so this uh, this will be interesting. The interesting thing to me about this is that Alice Hoffman wrote it, who also wrote Practical Magic, which I've read, and it's I remember the right book. It's pretty fluffy. So yeah, it wasn't a scene, and it was also movie? a not very good movie. Um, okay. The book was much better than the movie, but it was still kind of a you know, fluffy book. Um, so this should, be the, and this looks relatively serious. I'm kind of pretty serious, not relatively. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to reading it and, and giving it back. <laughs> Since I stole Yay! It. Next book, massacres. <laughs> Um, okay, so if you, if you are interested in this book and you would like to read us with us, we have a good reads group. Uh, look for us there. This video is hosted on YouTube. Um, all the other links are on pagespodcast.com. Uh, anything else? Where can people find you if they're looking for uh, you? If you are looking that? for me, I am Blue Caldwell pretty much everywhere. Um, BlueCaldwell.com is my blog that I don't up update very often. Uh, I'm mostly on Twitter, and uh, like I said, I do a lot of good reads. Um, Instagram, personally, I do a lot. We also have a, a Pages Podcast Instagram, but I don't do a whole lot with it. It's really a pain to switch back and forth between Instagram accounts. Um, I really need to facilitate that. Um, so that's where you can find me. You can find me at Kate Citrin and all the various social media groups. I have a blog that I kept up really well for about a year and a half. And it's really good. Have not since. But it's all still up there at... Uh, Blogspot that yoga, yoga badassery that blogspot dot com that one. <laughs> <laughs> when I put that yoga badassery in, it comes up. Yeah, the link is also. I'll put the link in the show notes, but it's also on pagespodcast.com. And I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, we were pretty long winded this time. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> hey, good night. Good night.